everyone for joining us today for the webinar, Creating a Differentiated IoT Solution, How IMS Leverages IoT to Create Value for Auto Insurers. My name is Jeannie Ford. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager, and I have the pleasure today of introducing our main speaker, Christopher Dell. But before we begin, I do want to go through a few housekeeping items. To ensure the highest quality sound or the highest sound quality possible, all phone lines will be muted and a recording of this webinar will be sent out to registrants tomorrow. So if you have any questions to ask for the presenter, please do submit them using the questions feature and we'll be sure to get some, as many of, of them as we can at the end of the webinar. If not, we'll definitely be sure to follow up. So before I dive into it, I do want to kick it off with a little bit of background on Hitachi Vantara. So Hitachi Vantara is a new company, but we have over 100 years of heritage. So despite being a new company, we have a very well-established global business with a wide ecosystem of partners and a really diverse and loyal set of customers. More than We've had more than 100 years in operational technology and more than 50 years in information technology, which gives us a really great foundation. Um, so Pentaho is a subsidiary of Hitachi, which is a $90 billion conglomerate. And we most recently were on number 79 um, on Fortune's Global 500 list. And we were acquired as a cornerstone of Hitachi's strate strategic big data analytics business. Um, so Pentaho is the analytics engine that really runs Hitachi's three areas of, of kind of big data. So it's big data, IoT, and predictive analytics, which you'll hear a great use case about today. So Hitachi offers a trusted and established track record in IT and a deep experience in OT. Like I mentioned earlier, we've had over 50 years of IT experience and then over 100 years of OT experience. So that really gives us over 107 years of industry domain knowledge. And because of that, we understand data better than anyone. And we are a data management, analytics, industrial expertise company that's really rolled into one solution. So we are the only kind of large vendor out there that really combines that IT and OT experience at, a, at an in-depth level. Now, before we jump into it, I do want to talk a little bit about kind of Pentaho and how we play in the data space. So if you look at this diagram, this data architecture diagram, in the past, people have worked with traditional data and kind of pushed that data into data warehouses and then pushed it through data marts so that the line of business has access to analytics. And Pentaho kind of serves as that in-between ETL tool or to get data in and out of each of those systems. Now, we're, we're kind of living in a world where big data is getting larger and larger and it's, it's exponentially growing. And so a lot of companies are using Hadoop to offload data into that because data warehouses are getting too large. And then they're kind of pushing that into analytic data sets um, to, so that the line of business has access to it. Now where Pentaho plays a role is we allow businesses to ingest any type of data source, whether it's traditional or big data, push it in and out of a data warehouse or Hadoop, blend that data, and then push it towards analytics so that you can make use of it, whether it's in the line of business, whether it's embedded into any application. Um, but, but we serve a number of different use cases, and we allow people to ingest and blend and prepare any type of data that's out there. So a couple of different use cases that we do serve, a central repository for analytics at, at scale to really solve that data silo problem, self-service analytics and allowing business users to be able to access analytics um, as needed without waiting on IT, on-demand data marts, embedded analytics. So taking our analytics, our charts, our visualizations, and our dashboards and embedding them into a third-party application, which is something that you're going to hear about today. Um, and then predictive analytics. So within the data integration tool for Pentaho, you can actually create your own models and plug them right into our end-to-end -end platform. So we have a number of different customers, um, hundreds and hundreds of customers actually, who've used Pentaho for a number of different analytics use cases. And I'm very excited today to have Christopher Dell talk about his use case um, with IMS and how he created an IoT solution and an embedded analytics solution. So Christopher Dell is a Senior Director of Product Management and Development at IMS. 
He is responsible for really translating that company's vision into a portfolio of products and aligning the core business functions to ensure that they have successful commercialization of product concepts and innovations. So he comes to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience of bringing new products to market, and he's held a number of different marketing and product management roles at BlackBerry, NCR Corporation, and Celestica. So we're very excited to have him talk about IMS's use case today. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Great. Thank you. Chris, do you have controls over there? Perfect. And uh, hopefully everybody's seeing my uh, slides now. I think uh, really quick, Chris, do you want to show your screen? Because it doesn't look there like it's go. coming through. Perfect. Right. Great. All right. Now that we sorted the easy part, the technology, we can uh, we can dive into uh, into some of the material. So uh, before I, I get too uh, deep into uh, what we're doing around big data and, and some of how we use Pentaho, uh, I thought I'd take a step back and just talk a little bit about IMS. So uh, we're a privately held company based in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And uh, we've really been focused on uh, the connected car space. And obviously we see this trend, this evolution from connected to car as kind of one of the first use cases of, of that broader IoT space. Um, and, and we operate in a number of different verticals. And for the purpose of today, I'm going to talk about one of our largest verticals around the insurance space and the insurance telematics space and some of the challenges they have and how we use some of the technology to be able to address it. But uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a different take on it. I'm also going to talk about um, how that data is applicable to other areas that you might not be, might, might not be expecting as we talk about it. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into it. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of a, a background in terms of what we're seeing as general trends kind of in the insurance industry, and, and then we'll talk about kind of how, uh, how we're helping to solve for some of those things. So one of the things, and again, when we're, when we're talking about insurance, we're very much focused on a, a concept called usage-based insurance or insurance telematics, using information about uh, the driving behavior, the vehicle itself in terms of how we inform it. But when we take a step back, we take that lens back a step and we look at what's going on in the auto industry, in the auto insurance industry, we're seeing a number of things that are happening. Uh, the first has been this whole trend around insurtechs, these combination of insurance-focused technology companies looking at ways they can take big data, artificial intelligence, other advanced applications, and start to apply them in the problem of insurance. Um, and, and so this is kind of that space that we live in, is somewhere in that insurtech, telematic space where we're starting to see that transformation. And uh, what's really interesting is considering how data rich the, the, our business is in uh, and seeing these macro trends. I mean, we, you know, with millennials right up to uh, older generations, just that overall openness in terms of sharing data. Um, you think about Google Maps, you're obviously there's this uh, implicit ag agreement that you have where you're sharing your location information and the re results you know, to receive results back in terms of navigation and traffic data. And we see these things proliferating in all sorts of different areas. And we think that the insurance industry, uh, we're, we're starting to see those things already emerge as well. And again, usage-based insurance is one of those examples. Now, why do insurance carriers care about usage-based insurance? Well, one, if they're able to use different factors, and it, rather than just your age, sex, the zip code you live in, the type of car you drive, but also how you drive and using that as a predictor in terms of the expected loss, that's key. And that's why insurance companies are looking at this. Now we've seen, again, there's a wealth of data. I think we collect 6 trillion data points on a daily basis and we have to kind of make sense of all that information on behalf of our clients. And, and, and so what we're seeing is, um, you know, this trend where we're starting to help transform it and how we apply, how we address all that, that big data that's coming in there and how we can use things like artificial intelligence to be able to kind of filter through all that noise and looking at how we automate some legacy processes uh, in, in terms of doing it. There hasn't been a lot of innovation from an insurance rating perspective as, as an example in the last 30 plus years and telematics is, is one of those areas that, uh, that promises to revolutionize it. Um, we, uh, we take a step back and again, when we look at this, how we can help a carrier, uh, we're looking at four different areas claims acquisition, retention, and engagement. And I'm going to touch upon them really quickly. Uh, the claim side, and this is key, 
up to 80% of the premiums that a carrier collects gets paid out in, in expense as a claim. Uh, it typically ranges somewhere between 65 and 80%. Now, just by having information about a potential claim, you get in an accident, and knowing that that much faster, you have an opportunity to reduce that by up to 20%. Um, and so there's things that we're able to do to transform that process to help reduce uh, the, the amount that's paid out uh, is, is key. And, and, and again, so we have technology that are able to automatically do that to be able to filter those things out and help the, the, the insurance carriers reduce what's being paid out. And of course, that means more profit to the bottom line or you know, more cost-effective rates for, for policyholders or hopefully both. Um, there's also a challenge we see in terms of acquisition. Um, and again, the acquisition costs can range up to $900, uh, where, where carriers are, are obviously still trying to protect their existing customers, but they're also trying to look at how they can cost-effectively acquire new customers. That's how they grow their overall base. Um, and, and again, with that, that cost, what we're seeing is things like telematics, because they provide better insights into, uh, into how you drive, they can start to look for opportunities where they said, you know what, Chris is a really good driver, but maybe he's not priced efficiently. Now we can offer him a more aggressive price because he has the type of risk that we're willing to underwrite um, and then offer me an attractive policy. And then, you know, the more aggressive carriers are able to offer tools like a try and buy application that allows them to uh, acquire new customers or to create new applications like, uh, you know, in the whole vehicle sharing space to be able to offer maybe underserviced segments. Um, obviously, retention is, is critical, and one of the interesting stats we found is by using telematics and providing that feedback to drivers, we see an 18 to 20 percent increase in retention. Um, and, and retention, and along with uh, what you know, I, I call it its sister, its engagement, it's critical. And, and today, insurance, auto insurance, has a real challenge where the consumer only interacts with uh, you know with their carrier a couple of times per year. And if you think about that, if you think you're in your own lives, it's typically upon policy renewal and, and, and hopefully not uh, during a claim. And, and so that's, a, that's when you have that level of engagement, you have a challenge there where it's easy, it's easy to undervalue the service that your carrier provides and say, you know what, I, I can get 20% cheaper or, or $100 off or some other cool feature uh, with a different carrier, why don't I switch? I really am not that emotionally tied to that particular carrier. But again, as we see with telematics, uh, when we provide telematics in there, we're seeing when somebody's checking their app, they're trying to figure out how to be a safer driver, uh, you know, then we're all of a sudden we see this uptick in terms of uh, two things. One, that overall engagement level, and two, uh, we see that they're actually safer, and safer means less risk. Uh, you know, as a parent, I'm obviously concerned about, you know, the safety and well-being of my family, uh, but the carrier, obviously, they're concerned about that, but they're also concerned about the bottom line and making sure that they're not paying out uh, unnecessarily on claims, and if they can help their policyholders improve that, then that's key. So the other part that we see when we talk about that engagement is through some, what telematics can do is really around behavior modification. And again, there's all sorts of statistics, and this is where we take that wealth of data and we look at it over time and we start to understand, uh, you know, how we can overall improve uh, the, the, the lives of our policyholders uh, and, and the, the bottom line for our carriers. And, and so what we've seen is through the use of telematics, you know, after a four-week period, that we see an 89% improvement in, in, in the overall driving behavior and, and either improvement or maintaining that safe behavior, so reinforcing those, those very good behaviors. Uh, and again, speeding is the one that I think we're all, you know, we can all be, you know, uh, guilty of. And again, through awareness and making sure people are aware of it, that's one of the areas we see the greatest uh, benefit in terms of the overall scores. So that is a bit of a backdrop. I thought I'd shift gears a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, kind of what some of that big data is that we're collecting there and what are some of the insights that are, we're, we're able to drive. Um, one of the challenges we have, and in, in the industry, uh, in the insurance telematics industry, there's a variety of ways we're able to collect data. And, uh, you know, we can do everything from integrated to the latest car that provides a very rich set of data on the right-hand side of the screen, right over to the left-hand side, where we can actually have algorithms and technology resident on the consumer's mobile phone and using those to infer driving behavior, uh, even who's driving the car. And, and there's a spectrum in between there. And they all have different merits between them. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail on this. We actually have a whole white paper that discusses the merits of these different areas. 
I think the key here, though, is th these are some of the challenges we have when we talk about collecting data. It's not a, a, a common set of data that we're collecting. Uh, there's not this homogeneity in that data, uh, and, and we kind of have to deal with that when we're looking at it and we're trying to apply rating algorithms and be able to understand what some of the implications are. The other part that, uh, which is critical is around security. And with uh, some of the new legislature that's going in place in Europe, uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, what the obligations are around there, uh, some of our customers are very much focused on servicing very specific segments. We have a carrier that's focused on servicing uh, you know, the, the families of US military personnel. And so obviously you want to make sure that that information is absolutely secure. Uh, again, even though you know we live in this era where we're willing to share information, uh, it's absolutely critical that uh, that we treat it, and we're entrusted with that data, and we protect it accordingly. And 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 so uh, one of the great things you know we've been recognized as you know kind of being head and shoulders above the competition in terms of uh, where we are and and how we handle that security, how we treat that you know when we're entrusted with that information. And and that that's interesting. That's critical, but it also is a challenge for us when we talk about wanting access to that data. Uh, and so we have these uh, debates internally about how we can leverage the big data that we're, you know, we see here, and how do we do it in a secure way that kind of makes sure that we're compliant with all the regulations and laws and rules and the obligations that our customers and their policyholders put upon us. And so it's an interesting challenge that I think many on the phone would be able to, you know, relate to in terms of I have all this data, but how do I unlock it in a way that, that keeps us compliant? So I'm going to step in a little bit again, talking a little bit more about the data. And you know, this is a, a modified version of, of, of what you've probably seen before in terms of data insights. And we all try and move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Certainly, that's our goal as we invest, continue to invest in insights and analytics. Um, when I talk about before the different data sources, um, that really points to that cleanse data. And if you think about the difference between a car reporting information and a phone, the difference is the car is always reporting about the car. The phone is with me, and it follows me on the train, it follows me on the bus, it follows me on my bike, and of course in the car, whether it's me or my spouse driving. And, and so that has some interesting implications. The other implications are, of course, you know, I might be using an iPhone. Um, someone else might be using an Android phone. They might be of different, uh, you know, different uh, versions, different quality levels. And being able to normalize that information across data sources and data types is critical. So we invest a lot in the data cleansing. So we've kind of got this level base piece, but also embracing some of the diversity in the data. So for example, on the mobile, all of a sudden we get interesting insights about how people travel. You know, do they use a mix of car and, and public transit? We can get that information through a mobile-based program. Um, again, our goal is really to move to the right-hand side in terms of prescriptive, you know, the prescri prescriptive element to it. Um, and again, so this is where, you know, we're able to say, hey, not only is, is Chris a really good driver, but this is what you should do, Carrier, about that, right? Or, you know, it looks like Chris has had a new driver added to the policy, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a new member in the family that so happens to be driving where you have the ability to detect that more than just being able to diagnose and predict that or, or diagnose it, it's about what do you do about that? Is that, you know, triggering an event to my agent or an outbound call that now says, call Chris and confirm that he's got the right uh, policies in place. Maybe something's changed. Life has changed and, and now all of a sudden you want to be able to go hit him with an appropriate message that says, you know what, looks like there's an additional driver or just maybe it's a, maybe it's a feeling call in terms of has anything changed and it's an opportunity to review that policy. It goes back to that engagement conversation that, that I mentioned at the beginning where, you know, this is, a, you know, driven by data. It's an opportunity for the carrier to stay relevant in the lives of their customers. Now, specifically, um, and, and again, shameless plug here for Pentaho uh, in terms of how we incorporate it, we've embedded the, 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 the business intelligence suite within a specific tool within our, our solution, what we call our business center. And, and business center is really that single place where, uh, our carriers, whether they're support staff, the people responsible for the program, uh, the uh, actuaries, the uh, claims adjusters, all go to the central portal to be able to kind of consume different data. And, and uh, a few years back, we looked at and took a step back and we wanted to figure out what we wanted to invest in and how we surfaced this up. And we, we chose the, uh, the Pentaho uh, suite and embedded it into our solution. 
Um, and uh, it might be a little fuzzy here on some people's screens, but there's a whole wealth of reports here that we then are able to expose. And a great example of how, you know, we had some previous reporting, kind of native reporting in our application, but a great use case is we had a customer we've been working for a number of years. We had a report that showed how often somebody unplugged a, a, a device that's installed in their vehicle. Had been available there for some time, and when we were modeling out the effectiveness of some of these tools, we ported that report into, into, into our BI uh, component. And in that BI component, uh, the customer is quite, very quickly able to uh, look at some outliers. And when they looked at the outliers, they found that there was one specific vehicle, one specific policy, where they saw this huge frequency of, of disconnects and connects. Uh, you know, somebody was unplugging a piece of technology we provided and plugging plug it back in. And, and, and talking with uh, this carrier and their staff there, they couldn't figure it all out. And they decided to actually reach out to that policyholder and they talked to the policyholder and, and, and he talked to his spouse um, and they couldn't figure it out. And when they talked to their teen son, what they then realized is the teen son, when every day, he, every weekend he got the car Friday night, reached under the dash, unplugged the device, and Sunday morning he plugged it back in. Um, and, and so that's a great example where um, they had access to that information it was a bit like finding a needle in a haystack, and just through some visualization, they were able to identify that. And in this case, you know, the policyholder, they could have that conversation with the policyholder that to remain engaged in the program, they need to make sure that they are uh, keeping that device plugged in. Obviously, if it's going to the garage or there's, uh, you know, abnormal circumstances, that's fine, but by general course, that should be remain in there. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's an opportunity for a little bit of education between parent and teen. Um, and that situation resol resolved. And again, I think the key there is we have that data. It was just really hard to find that data. Uh, and, and so that's one area where the, the tool set helped us kind of uh, surface that up. Now, I'm going to talk about two different areas. Uh, the first is around distracted driving. And when you look at over the last 50 years, the general trends on a constant mile basis um, that fatalities are going down year over year for the last 50 years. And it's only in the last recent years that we start to see that increase. And, and it's not because cars aren't safer, certainly with uh, adaptive cruise control, accident avoidance technology, uh, the vehicles themselves are safer more than ever. But what is occurring obviously is distracted driving. And so we've been investigating and investing in this space for, uh, for a number of years and wanted to pull out and surface some, some statistics here. Uh, and, and these might be a little bit alarming, uh, but, but again, you know, the, the data doesn't lie here. So the first thing when we look at across, uh, you know, in aggregation, that we saw that 53% of trips had some element of distracted driving. Uh, and then when you boil it down, because sometimes that's actually occurring when you're at a stoplight or you pulled over, you did the right thing and you pulled over uh, and you had that phone conversation, but there's still 36% of those trips that are occurring while you're moving. And, and, in, and furthermore, you know, the average element of distraction is 94 seconds long. That's a minute and a half. And you can imagine at highway speeds, even at one or two seconds of distraction, the results could be catastrophic. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we started to surface this data up and then we started thinking about it with our data scientists and, and our product folks in terms of how we address it. And so what we've done is we've categorized distracted driving in several different levels. You know, at the first level is at a cognitive level, you know, you can think about that, you know, when you're having a, you know, a really emotionally intense conversation, you're very much focused on that conversation uh, and not necessarily what you're doing behind the wheel. Uh, or the other scenario is, you know, you drove to work and, and you can't remember the last three stoplights you went through. Your mind wandered uh, and, and that's where you have that moment of panic and think, did I go through a red light? Uh, I know, no, I didn't think I did because I didn't hear any car horns and now, and, and, but you have that situation. There's that cognitive distraction, whether it's active or passive. Uh, the second level is that physical distraction. Uh, maybe it's because I'm holding up the phone to my ear or I've got it on speakerphone and I'm, I'm, I'm talking. Uh, maybe it's because I'm actually physically typing into the keyboard. Uh, or, you know, and, and, and then the third one is the visual distraction, when I'm physically taking my eyes off the road and looking at the phone. Now, there's limits to what we are able to detect. So sometimes we're actually inferring some of those behaviors. Sometimes we're actually getting it through some predictive algorithms on the phone. Uh, but we characterize those in a number of different levels in terms of low, medium, and high. Uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, there, there is cognitive load in terms of having a conversation, even if my phone is paired to the Bluetooth system. 
uh, and I'm talking, and, but but again, that takes a, an element of load that is, you know, I'm not focused necessarily on the vehicle. Um, of course, you know, the medium one is where, again, I'm holding the phone. It means I don't have my hands on nine and three on the steering wheel. Um, and then, of course, the, the worst scenario is, is where I'm looking at or responding to a text message or I'm searching up directions or something else. So we kind of categorize those in different levels, and, and we service that back up to the user and back to the carrier. And the user User, again, the goal is to inform uh, and hopefully correct some of those behaviors so that they understand what that potential risk is. Um, and just looking some, at some additional statistics, um, at the top, when we look at just that kind of that phone call, you know, the, the phone call type events, and this is a subset just while moving, um, you know, on, on average, consumers are spending more than four minutes on the phone, and again, there's a cognitive load. Now, the good side is, so certainly longer in duration. Uh, the flip side, uh, side to that is there's a lot less trips, especially when we talk about relative to phone handling, that occurs. But these typically happen at a, at a longer duration. So less frequent, but longer duration. And again, these are lower typically in severity um, in, in, in terms of what they are. The phone handling ones are the ones that really give me cause and, and pause, where in our, on average, it's almost a minute of distraction, again, while moving. So at the stoplight, pulled over, you know, we're, we're excluding those events. And what, but what we're seeing is 28% of uh, trips have some element of phone handling distraction while driving. And again, it, it's, you know, again, at highway speed, one or two seconds of inattentiveness uh, because you're typing on the keyboard uh, or looking at the screen and again, typing on the keyboard uh, typically requires your hands physically on the phone as well as your eyes on the phone, um, you know, is the, is the highest severity on it. And so, so these statistics are very troubling. Um, and again, this allows us having this data to start to do things like creating scoring algorithms, providing alerts back to, to, uh, to the driver, notifying a parent if a teen's doing this. There's a variety of things that we're able to do from an awareness perspective. Um, and then of course, working with our carrier partners, the other things we can do is provide incentives for encouraging the right behavior uh, or, or, or kind of reducing uh, a discount or a refund or a reward if they're exhibiting the negative behavior. Uh, so again, having this data is able to kind of surface that up to us and then certainly take action on them. Now, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, and I alluded to it at the beginning. Um, and so far, what I've really talked about is very auto insurance centric. Now, there's been a, there was a couple of events uh, that happened in the U.S. that allows us to exhibit some interesting information that's not specific to the auto space. Now, certainly I'll draw some parallels there, um, but uh, in, in, in late August, you know, the greater Houston area was, was hit by uh, Hurricane Harvey. And then uh, just a few weeks later in early September, uh, Florida was impacted by Hurricane Irma. And, and so we have a wealth of data that uh, starts to allow us to, to, to make insights around uh, what occurs. And, and so the first two graphs we have here, uh, again on the left is Harvey, and then on the right is from Hurricane Irma. We see in the green, you know, for example, the average trip activity. You can see that there's some, some daily variation kind of day to day, uh, kind of leading up to uh, when the actual hurricanes hit. And then in both in red, which is the wind speed, and in blue, the precipitation, uh, you can see that the vehicle traffic dropped off. And then it starts to rebound afterwards, you know, in, in uh, by, by the end of August for, for Hurricane Harvey. And we saw this similar trend happen to Hurricane Irma. You know, not necessarily uh, revolutionary in terms of it, um, but again, but we started to look at other types of behavior. And this is where we start to really segment some of that data out uh, in, in terms of looking at it. And so I'm going to uh, kind of share with you kind of a, a more complex views of this. You know, the first one here, if we look at Harvey, um, you know, we can start to look at what occurred, right? Which number of vehicles were in motion um, uh, being driven, for example, before the hurricane that were no longer driving afterwards, right? And so you can see that there's like 27% of vehicles uh, that were active kind of pre-Hurricane pre Harvey uh, that were no longer active. Um, and, and so that becomes kind of an interesting insight in terms of, um, is, 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 you know, is that an indication of loss uh, does it, or, or is it because you know, people had left their vehicle, you know, the after period, we didn't measure that for months and months afterwards, uh, that maybe that they were living with friends and family and they hadn't actually returned to where they left one of their two vehicles. 
uh, but it starts to give you kind of that indication. You also can see here, just again, staying with Harvey, you know, up to 50% of those vehicles were still in active use both before, during, and it could be because they're trying to get to evacuation centers or trying to get out of the path, um, and, and as well as after. Um, in Irma, we decided to look at the data a little bit differently because, you know, there's this mandatory evacuation period, and, and you can start to get these insights in terms of before, uh, and then during the mandatory evacuation period, what happened, and then the number of people who, who continue to drive kind of during it. Uh, for this example, we don't have the statistics uh, on, on, the, on the post period, uh, because what we really wanted to zero in is something a little bit different. We wanted to look at, for example, this data could tell you, are mandatory uh, evacuation notifications, are they valid? Do they drive value around them? Um, and, and so this is an area where you know, IMS or an insurance carrier may not be directly applicable to us, uh, but it starts to have some really interesting insights if you're responsible for, uh, you know, uh, disaster planning, uh, you know, from that perspective, or you're in a different part of uh, the space in terms of, uh, you know, understanding, for example, um, you know, other insights you might be able to glean from it. Um, taking a slightly different perspective on it, Looking at the actual driving behavior, and each one of these dots represents a set of trips. Uh, again, this is the data from Houston, and we see before. This is kind of our baseline in terms of we see that kind of driving behavior. Uh, and seeing it kind of plot out on a map, then you start to see what happened during, uh, during the hurricane. And obviously, we see a great drop-off, you know, kind of similar to what we saw in that Venn diagram uh, in terms of behavior. But you start to see what, you know, what really occurred here. Uh, and then you start to see after as well. And I don't have the overlays here for it, but if you start to overlay, for example, where flood damage is, and you can start to see those patterns of behavior uh, where there are a lot less driving trips in those areas where that there's, uh, you know, flooding flooding activity there. It also starts to get you get you an idea in terms of, um, you know, where people are going, where they might have gone. Uh, if you look at origin and destination information, which is not the visual I'm presenting here, you start to understand, you know, where do people go to, to seek refuge? Um, and, and, you know, were, were they going to the, the kind of the outer areas outside of uh, kind of the Galveston, Houston kind of area, uh, or, 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 or did they kind of stay put? Uh, again, we have all these insights. We have that wealth of data that's uh, not necessarily, you know, obviously relative to an auto insurer, but also, you know, much more applicable in, in other particular areas. Um, Irma, again, oh, and then, sorry, and then two weeks afterwards with Harvey, again, you see this resumption of travel, that's kind of the period that is, you know, the flooding has largely subsided, uh, and you see things kind of restore back to kind of almost a pre-normal level uh, where, uh, where, th where they were, uh, you know, just uh, prior to the hurricane. And then looking at the scenario kind of with Irma, and Irma is a little bit different. Again, the data we've got here kind of shows uh, before and then during the evacuation period and kind of following that. Um, the other challenge there, of course, is the predictions that they had. They weren't sure if it was going to, you know, the hurricane was going to make landfall on the east side of, of, of Florida and hit kind of Miami or, or eventually the path that it did through the, the Florida Keys and, and up into the west side and then before making landfall in there. So we see this kind of driving behavior. This is kind of the base case here. We, we see during that evacuation period, uh, you know, pretty consistent, not a lot of drop off in terms of some of that behavior. Uh, in, in terms of driving behavior, and then during that actual hurricane, uh, we see a lot, you know, that, that a big drop in as people either got to their destinations or, or those that chose to try and wait it out, try to, you know, weighing it out, uh, waiting it out in terms of where they were. So you see this mix in terms of statistics and, and how we're able to surface up this data. Uh, we, we found it very fascinating in terms of looking at that uh, and, and then what that can tell us in terms of other areas. Um, taking a step back again, you know, in, 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 in different areas, the insights we're able to provide, looking at, for example, um, you know, the, my vehicle activity, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a three-driver, uh, two-vehicle household, and, and a carrier, if they're able to determine that one car is static, it's sitting in my driveway, and the other one drove down, you know, in this case, you know, I take a family trip to, uh, to California, um, then all of a sudden that becomes a really interesting insight where a vehicle has now gone on the proverbial road trip, uh, and the other vehicle static, does that now mean the exposure on the home side is different because, you know, you're, you're now one vehicle's out of state, another one is resident. It looks like it can be predictive of, you know, certain behaviors, like I'm on a, fam you know, on a road trip. 
Um, and that might be to drive a prompter to push back to me, the policyholder, and say, hey, make sure friends or family uh, have checked in on your home to make sure that that leaky faucet didn't lead into some sort of, you know, flood damage that maybe you're not covered for. So those are the type of insights that we look at um, and that we're able to kind of gather, not just driving specific, but that impacts a home, or in this case, in the case of hurricanes uh, Houston and, and uh, sorry, Hurricane Harvey and Irma, uh, much broader in terms of predictive around it. And then of course, you can see here the, the, the resumption of that overall driving behavior. Again, looks very similar to what we saw uh, at, the, at the beginning of, uh, or, or prior to Hurricane Irma. Um, so there are, I mentioned a white paper that, that talked about kind of the different data sources and, and kind of the pros and cons to it. We have a wealth of information that kind of explores these areas and I'll leave that up here. Uh, again, you can, you can go on this and find some of those white papers. If you're in the telematics space, um, even if you're not necessarily directly in the telematics space, it may be worthwhile taking a look through that information because those insights we talked about you know, the challenges we have uh, are very similar, right? Now, obviously, it may not be applicable to a vehicle, but when we talk about IoT and the wealth of data um, and, and the cleansing of the data across different sensors, there may be a high degree of applicability where you're able to kind of take lessons that we've learned and apply them to a different problem space. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pass it back over here uh, for, I think, the Q&A session. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Um, let's see, it does look like we had a couple of questions come in, and then if anyone does have any questions at the moment, feel free to enter them into the questions panel. We'll try to we'll try to get to them. Um, I know we don't have too much time, but we'll try to get to them as fast as we can. So, first one's pretty easy, and I can take this. Is it possible to get a copy of this? Um, Yes, absolutely. We will be sending out a recording of this presentation tomorrow, I believe, um, or by the end of the week, you should receive a copy of it if you're registered. And then it does look like we have one or two other questions. So one of them, and I'll pass this over to you, Chris. Um, as you are evaluating technology partners, what key criteria were you looking for? Oh, great, great question. So, so I think there's a number of things. Uh, one, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, in, in general, you know, we have to deal with scale. Uh, as I mentioned, the security was absolutely critical on it. And, uh, and, and, and we wanted, because, you know, we have this wealth of data coming in from all sorts of disparate sources, we were very much looking for a solution that allowed us to kind of pull that in uh, from those different areas where it may not be data that we collect directly. So weather data, traffic data would be two good examples of data that maybe we're ingesting that, that, that isn't, na I would say, native to what IMS collects. So I think those are a couple of areas, scale, security, and the ability to ingest the kind of this variety of data uh, that maybe isn't necessarily resident natively within our environment. Great, thanks Chris. And then it looks like we had one other question, um, which I think would be great for the rest of the audience to hear, is what challenges did you face as you were coming up with the IMS platform? Oh, great, great question. Um, so again, I, I think the, uh, the challenges around data cleansing certainly is, is, has been a challenge. Uh, the industry has evolved from having kind of devices very much tied to a vehicle to these plug-in devices to mobile technology, and now it's kind of the, the pendulum's kind of swung where there's a variety of different sources and, and types of technology that are being used. Um, and, and so being able to, A, deal with that volume, and B, being able to normalize and cleanse that data uh, is one of our big challenges there. Um, and then, and then of course, you know, the real step, the real challenge is collecting the data is kind of interesting, but transforming that into those, those actionable insights is, 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 is critical, right? And, uh, and again, whether it's on the auto side or they're more broad in terms of, you know, we've aggregated driving behavior across, you know, a particular highway corridor, and that might be really interesting to uh, the government agency responsible for maintaining that or investing in it. Those are the type of insights that uh, you know we, we seek to unlock with these investments. Great, thank you. And then this one, I'm not sure it's a little bit broader, so I don't know if you do want to take a stab at it. We'll, we'll give it a try. Regarding usage-based insurance, it seems that current solutions in the market are insurer-specific, like driving score. Is there any trend to standardize it? 
that's a that's a great question. I, I actually love this question. Um, and so, what we see here is, you know, if, if you're a large carrier, you don't necessarily want to standardize what that scoring is. Um, you you you've invested in actuarial skills. You believe your models are more predictive than your competitors are, and and a standardized score doesn't necessarily benefit you. If you're a broker, and in some markets, brokers are, are, are much more, are, are stronger. And in Canada and the UK, for example, there's a much bigger part of policies that are written by brokers. If you're a smaller carrier, if you're a value play, um, then having standardized scores may be more attractive to you. You know, you don't invest in, in advertising. You want a way to kind of level the, the playing field against some of the big guys. Um, and that would be more of an area. And, and so I, I see this as an area that may, you know, that, that, that carriers are kind of, well, if we do that, are we just commoditizing ourselves around that? And then it becomes a pricing discussion. Uh, or, or is there still some layer that we can apply on top of that that is still more predictive? So I, I think it's still premature. I know certainly there's been a lot of talk about that. You know, is there going to be a driving score similar to like a credit score? Um, and and I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we're necessarily going to see that. Again, just the differences in data sources, a phone versus something tied to your vehicle, very considerably, and the strategies around how you use that information, uh, very considerably. Great, thanks. And then well, I am going to take one more question um, before we end this, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm also going to pass it your way, Chris. Um, does IMS support new OEM vehicle manufacturers collecting, I think it's CAN bus data to analyze for similar usage insights versus servicing just insurance companies? So I think the question is, do you support um, OEM vehicle manufacturers collect, collecting data? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, and, and the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and, and so we work with OEMs uh, to collect that data. And what's interesting is, and, and, and obviously the, uh, the person raising the question is, uh, has some familiarity with it. We see a big disparity in terms of what some, the, the available data that's coming from the vehicles. And sometimes it's fairly limited. Things, you know, think about just getting your odometer value in your VIN. Some carriers are surfacing up, sorry, some OEMs are surfacing up a lot of more rich data. And, and while we spent a lot of time in this webinar talking about what we do from an insurance telematics space, we actually operate in a number of different verticals and having access to that data is, uh, is really relevant. So for example, you know, we operate in, in a road usage charging programs in a number of states and having access, for example, to odometer values uh, is critical in terms of uh, being able to provide that or provides a, a complement we're able to do. Having access to the, the CAN bus data uh, is, is really valuable when we work with some of our partners in terms of transforming, you know, something that's going on with a vehicle back to a dealer, a carrier, um, a, 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 the policyholder themselves in terms of saying, you, you know, your check engine light came on or your car's reporting something, here's an estimated repair cost, uh, here is, you know, your action. By the way, we can schedule an appointment with your dealer. You know, those kind of insights transform a bit of data into something that's actionable for the policyholder or the end user or the vehicle owner uh, being able to do that. So the short answer is yes, we absolutely do and collect that information and we look forward to the increasing wealth of that information. And we apply it not only just from an insurance, but across a number of different verticals that we participate in. Great. Thanks, Chris. And I, I know I said that one more question, but a really good one came in that was kind of related to that in terms of kind of being able to blend different types of information. Do you also include environmental or contextual data in your scoring models, such as weather data? Absolutely, yeah. So, so, so contextual data, whether it's uh, information about related to the roads, flow of traffic, weather, um, you know, we have the opportunity to enrich our programs with all that data. Uh, and, and again, sometimes, for example, weather data is a great example where, you know, when we collect data about a vehicle, we're able to get it at a very high frequency, sometimes sub-second intervals. Weather data, you might be getting at it at a, at a quarter of a mile radius or at a, at a higher level. Certainly, there's data sources that provide uh, road, you know, the, the temperature of the road, precipitation in some sort of micro context. Uh, but as those data sources get richer, uh, and I would also say more cost effective, we absolutely enrich them in our data sources and start to underlay, you know, and I'll use speeding as a great example. You know, the speed limit might be 65 miles an hour uh, and you're doing 70 miles an hour. Is that unsafe or is it unsafe relative to the actual traffic 
flow of traffic, if the flow of traffic is 72 miles an hour, then it's like, okay, well, you know what, maybe we don't penalize the driver because of that. That's a great example of how you start to contextualize, uh, you know, the actual driving behavior uh, in different ways. Great. Well, this was this was an absolutely fantastic presentation. Thanks so much, Chris, um, and thank you so much to the audience. I, I do know there's a few more questions that we weren't able to get to, um, and we'll follow up on email on that, but really appreciate everybody listening in, and we'll be sure to send a copy of this tomorrow. Um, all righty. Well, thanks so much, everybody.